for the Food and Wine Festival, they're going to be doing a farm to table presentation. We are going to all sit here and enjoy the show and see what kind of food they're going to bring out. Yeah. So, farm okay. to table should be good. Yep, this is true. Here. So, welcome to the 2018 Disney California Adventure Food and Wine Festival. You've made it. Yes. All right, are you guys having a good time so far? Yes. What have you seen? Food. Food, everywhere, everywhere. You have to taste it, so good. All right, well this year we're happy to feature over a dozen delicious festival marketplaces, and they're all serving up fresh California-grown flavors. It's also exciting to see top chefs in action, okay? You can't miss that, you do not want to miss out. There are still seats available for the Celebrity Chef Live at the Hyperion Theater, uh, featuring Guy Fieri himself on March 9th. And we also have a few seats available left for the Winemaker Dinner, where you can sample and savor exceptional wine and food pairings from all over California. And there's still room available for the fabulous Brewmaster Dinner. Uh, we're featuring delicious flavors from the Carl Strauss Brewing Company. And you can go to Disneyland.com slash food and wine to purchase tickets. And for more information, if you want to check the daily events on the festival guide or on the info boards throughout the festival. All right, are you ready to meet our visiting presenter? Yes! All right, let me tell you a little bit about her. Coming up is a special guest from Point Reyes Farmstead, which is part of the California Milk Advisory Board in partnership with California Grown. Now, California Grown organization is all about connecting Californias with people who grow and produce our food. Very important. So please join me in welcoming the National Sales Director of the Point Reyes Farmstead Cheese Company, Felice Charlton. Hi, Felice. Hi. How you doing? Great. Good to see you. Good to see you too. Thanks, Thanks for, for having me. Thanks for coming. Yeah. Come on into the kitchen here. So we are excited to have you here because this woman is a master at all things cheese. We are like bow down to you. You are the cheese <laughs> queen and we love that. So I have to ask, how long have you been in this business? Well, I grew up on a farm in Northern California, so I've been in this is my whole life. But um, I've been with this specific company for about four years. And you also serve on the board of directors of the California Artists and Cheese Guild. Tell us about the guild and its work. It's very cool. This is true. So the California Artists and Cheese Guild is a uh, nonprofit uh, organization that promotes, educates, and entertains uh, California cheese and cheese making. Um, it works a lot with the CMAB, which is the California Milk Advisory Board, which um, promotes and educates all California dairy. Okay. That's amazing. And how did you get involved with this organization? Just my love of cheese, my love of California dairy, yeah. and um, what can I do? How can I volunteer? What can I do more for it? Yeah, amazing. Okay, let's let's talk about the farm a little bit because the farm is just an incredible operation. Can you tell us a little bit about it? What are the specs? What do we need to know? Sure. Can you set the scene here? Yeah, yeah. So, who here has been to Northern California? Um, yeah. This actually feels like a Northern California day, right? And if you're a cow, you love this climate because you're big, you have a lot of fur, um, you don't want to be in super, super hot weather, and you don't really want to be in the snow. So Northern California is the home of happy cows. And the Giacomini Dairy is about a one hour north of the Golden Gate Bridge, set on um, the Tamales Bodega Bay, if you've ever been up there. Yep. Um, it's 700 acres, we have 400 Holstein. Um, so the definition of a farmstead, which we are, is we milk our own cows and we make cheese with our own milk. So it's a closed process, um, which is a pretty unique experience for cheese making. There aren't a lot of farmstead cheese companies in California, maybe about two or three. Um, the farm is rolling green hills. If you could picture sort of Ireland and that sort of look of just lush, uh, natural rye grass and rolling green hills, that's what it looks like. It sounds idyllic. Yeah, it counts, it is. Right? It is. No it wonder is. they're so happy. Yes. Yes. That's incredible. And so, and I, we were talking a little bit, and I, I understand that actually you really do need about an acre of land for every cow. And you guys have about 400 cows, but over 700 That's acres. That's right. That's right. So, so, yeah, ideally, if you're farming, you like to have an acre per cow. And we are above that ideal because we have 700 acres and 400 cows. So they have a pretty, pretty lush experience. 
Okay, and so we want to talk about the location and the coastal breezes because you mentioned this a little bit. Um, you know, it's, it's actually really important for the cheese making process. Can you explain why? Yeah, so if you take a climate like this where it's high humidity, cool weather, um, this is very, very similar to what it's like in Point Reyes, California. It can be January, it, it can be July. It doesn't, the, the temper, temperature and humidity variation isn't that extreme in Northern California. So it adds this foggy marine layer to um, the climate and the fog actually has a lot of salt and minerals in it because it's coming right off of the Pacific Ocean. So the fog sort of makes the grass very salty and high minerality and then in turn the animals eat the green high minerality salty grass and the milk tastes like that. So it's a really, really perfect milk for cheese making. So it sounds a lot like wine making, right? Or yep, growing exactly. anything like, um, you know, work, you know, grapes are a really great example because it's all yes. about the, the land or the terroir. Yeah, so we use terroir in cheese making as well. We use that term as well. And our terroir is going to be very different than, say, Wisconsin or Vermont or Florida. They all do make cheese in those states wonderful cheese, yeah. but it's a completely different climate. Yes. Okay, so the fog comes down from the Pacific coast. It sort of settles right there on the surface of, you know, the grass and the pasture, and then it feeds the nutrients in the grass, which then feeds the cow and flavors the cheese. Exactly. How cool is that? Yeah. yeah. Did you guys know that? <laughs> you know, now you know. You're in well-informed cheese people. Okay, great. Yeah. So um, this is awesome. I want to actually get into the history a little bit about how cheese was made yeah. and how long ago it was made. Can you get into that? Yeah, yeah. So cheese is made. Cheese is over 4,000 years old. There's actually illustrations in the pyramids in Egypt of cheese making. Um, we think it originated in the Middle East, and the story is. And it sounds pretty true, but it wasn't written down anywhere, so we just have to just assume that it's true. The story is, is that when they would ride across the desert on camels, they would put um, camel milk inside satchels on their camels, and then the um, kind of pounding across the desert would agitate the milk, and at the end of their journey, it turned into sort of a ricotta cottage cheese consistency. Um, so that was the first cheese that was made, um, and ricotta and cottage cheese are still made today and still one of the best cheeses out there. But unlike, um, like, camel cheese is actually a real, a real yes. thing. I, yes. I don't know if you guys know this, but Felice was telling us that it actually is something that you can buy in the Middle East. Absolutely. All over. Yeah, so there's camel cheese. Um, you can make cheese from any animal that produces milk. So water buffalo is um, a really delicious cheese. Um, obviously, cows, sheep, goats, camels. I mean, theoretically, you could milk a giraffe, <laughs> make giraffe cheese, but I've never had that, but I'm sure somebody out there has done it. And Point Reyes really focuses on cow's milk cheese we, exclusively. Right. Yeah, we just do cow's milk. You know, I'm curious also about these plant-based cheeses. What are your yeah. thoughts on those? Yeah, so um, that's sort of a new up-and-coming um, style of cheese, and they're becoming more popular, the nut milk cheeses, uh, coconut cheeses, and um, there's so much room in the cheese category for everybody, just like there's room in the fluid milk category. If you look at your dairy case at the grocery store, you'll see coconut milk, soy milk, all of those. So as far as I'm concerned, the more the merrier. Yeah, I, I, I agree. And just so that you guys know, it's available. If you're vegan or vegetarian yeah. and you just don't like to eat cheese, maybe because of the dietary restrictions that you hold, then you know almond milk cheese is great. Cashew yeah, milk cheese absolutely. is great. Yeah. Um, and if you can indulge, try Point Reyes. Yes. Because their original blue is one of my all-time favorite cheeses. It's Thank you. so delicious. Thank you. It's we actually just won first place at the World Cheese Award in London for uh, Best in Its Category for Blue Cheese. So Amazing. Yeah, you can try it um, here at the park. And you can um, get it right at the Nuts About Cheese Marketplace right over here. They'll give you a little cheese tasting, a cheese plate with some fruit and nuts. It's delicious. Yeah, so it's truly one of the best cheeses in the world. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, let's get into the technique because this mm -hmm. is really fascinating. So there's a lot that goes into actually making cheese. Um, tell us about the ingredients used and then the technique. Yeah, so just like baking, it's a really similar um, artistry. When you bake, it's kind of a little bit of science and a little bit of art, and cheese making is really similar. So it's made with four core ingredients, and um, the analogy I 
use that's similar to baking is like you can have butter, eggs, flour, and sugar, and with that you can make a pie crust, or you can make cookies or a pound cake, and what the difference is is the recipe. So the recipe which she's making is really how you're gonna find your different cheeses, like mozzarella or cheddar or jack. They're all made with the same ingredients, but the recipe is very different. Can you tell us, what are these four ingredients? Is it like milk, rennet? Milk, rennet, salt. culture, salt, basically, yeah. And then so the recipe will vary depending on how long you hold it. Yeah. Maybe other things you might add to it, like certain molds or things like that. Is that is that how it's changed? Yeah, you can add mold. You can um, age it. So you, there's some cheddars in the world. Like there's some cheddars from England that are aged about 15 years, and they're delicious. Um, so or you can have a fresh mozzarella that's you know two hours old and it's delicious. So right there, just aging the cheese makes a big difference. Uh, the humidity that it's aged in, so you could age, if you want a cheese to have a rind, which is basically like the crust of a bread, you would age it in low humidity, which sort of um, encourages rind growth and makes a firmer, um, tooth, toothier style cheese, or you could age your cheese in a high humidity and then it would end up more like a brie or like a softer cheese. And I heard that rindless, all is all like rindless cheeses are all natural and gluten free, mm -hmm. which is really great to know. Um, but what would make it have gluten if you had the rind? Why is that? Yeah, so there are some cheeses mold that have mold, for example, and then like a Roquefort from France um, is a very traditional blue cheese, and the mold that is. Um, used to add to the Roquefort, it was actually derived from bread. It's a bread mold. So theoretically, the bread would have gluten in it, therefore the cheese wouldn't have gluten in it. Okay, great. So if you can't do gluten, then a rindless cheese would be the best bet. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, okay, and so what are the most popular types of cheeses, you think? Like, what are, what are consumers go looking, looking for when they shop for cheese or when they're at the farmer's market? Yeah, what is well, the best-selling cheese in the world, the most quantity or most volume is mozzarella, and that's on pizza. So um, pizza is probably the uh, most common application for cheese. So mozzarella is therefore the um, most uh, cheese that's sold at the most volume in the world. Um, and then for every day, you have your, you know, Jack, your um, cheddar, all of those sort of more simpler farmer type cheeses. And then if you want to have a specialty cheese experience, you have your camembert and your Brie's and your Blue's, which are maybe a little bit, um, a little bit more expensive, a little bit stronger flavor. And then can you recommend any uh, desserts using cheese? Absolutely. So uh, ricotta is a beautiful uh, soft fresh cheese. It's really, really good with yeah. a little drizzle of honey and maybe some cocoa powder and sliced strawberries. In Europe, their, their idea of dessert can be very different from ours and often they'll do a cheese plate. So they'll have um, several small pieces of specialty cheeses with like a little piece of dark chocolate and maybe some dried fruits and nuts and um, that to them is dessert. Okay, I have to share this with you because you just mentioned it. My yeah. favorite dessert is grilled peaches. Ooh. Take them off the grill when they're really nice and caramelized and then top it with a little ricotta cheese <sighs> drizzled with honey, just yes. like you said. She was halfway there. <laughs> I'm telling you, with the grilled peach, you guys, it is to die for. You have to try it. That's and amazing. super simple, right? Yeah, and yeah totally that. simple, yeah. All right, so I think it's time to taste some cheese, or to look at some cheese. Yeah. We're actually not gonna taste, but we are gonna look. Um, so we have some some different plates of cheese here. Here, I'll um, put them up. How pretty is that? So let's kind of go over what we have here. Uh, we'll start with uh, something like a manchego. Can you mm -hmm. tell us, kind of talk us through some of these sure. cheeses? Absolutely. Maybe the qualities of them. Yeah, so uh, manchego is only from Spain. So there are cheeses that have a, um, very special history to them. For example, um, Roquefort, Gorgonzola, blue cheese are all blue vein cheeses in the blue category, but they're from different countries. So they're essentially the same cheese. Like um, if, you, if somebody says, oh, I want to use a Gorgonzola on that recipe, you can probably replace it with a Roquefort or an American style blue vein cheese. Yeah. It's more the name of Gorgonzola is from Italy. So Manchego is actually a sheep's milk cheese from Spain. Um, so you'll find, sometimes you can find a semi-firm sheep's milk cheese from the US that has 
uh, Manchego qualities, but it can't actually legally be called Manchego because it's not produced in the Spanish exactly. region. Yeah. Got it. Good to know. Yeah. And then what about something like a Gouda? Yeah, so Gouda is really friendly. This looks like a smoked Gouda. I can smell it. Um, oh, when you're, yeah. yeah, when you're building a cheese plate for your for yourself or your guests, people really eat with their eyes. Um, so it's important to have different colors on a cheese plate, and the smoked Gouda adds that nice sort of um, dark tan rind that's really pretty. Um, and then you'll have, for example, on this pretty cheese plate, you have a um, an orange cheddar, a blue. Um, so. You might want to add, there's a great cheese called Red Hawk that has a red rind. Um, so really think about different colors when you're putting together a cheese plate. And the smoked Gouda is beautiful. Uh, most people love it. Yeah. And then, of course, one of the kings of all cheese, which is Parmesan no Yeah. Right? We love this. Yeah, so good. And don't be shy if it dries up. Sometimes you'll buy like a block of Parmesan and you'll throw it in your cheese drawer and then you pull that out a month later and you're like, oh my gosh, this is rock hard. It's still totally fine to use. Just grate it. And as a matter of fact, if you have any firm cheese, like a jack or a cheddar that you've forgotten to cover and it gets kind of hard on one okay. side of it, you can grate that like a Parmesan. Really? Yeah. Like the rind side. The rind side. Wow. If it's really firm and um, sort of dried out, it, you can grate it on top of pasta or vegetables and use it just like a Parmesan. Great. Yeah. And then if you're going to cut, slice, and slice and eat, you can, of course, always eat the rind, right? Do you recommend I'm that? a rind eater I'm a rind myself. Eater yes. But I'm the person at the Christmas party when people leave all the outside, the exterior of the brie. I go up and like take that and I'm like, this is so good. Why would you leave this? Yeah. But that's just personal preference. Yeah. Yeah. Um, another thing that I was raised to do is take the rind off, keep it in the freezer, and then throw it in a, a like a soup. Like oh, a, like absolutely. A soup, and it like yeah. melts. It gives this melty, cheesy saltiness that you can't get from salt. It adds like a like a dairy quality without it being gooey, gooey, cheesy. It just like this this the salt and the I don't actually know what it is, but the flavor of yeah, the cheese. Yeah, I agree. Which is yeah, great, especially yeah. in like a pot of beans. Yum. Yeah. Don't ever waste. Cheese. Don't ever waste it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now tell me about Point Reyes blue cheese yeah. and all the other offerings that you guys make. Yeah. So um, we're best known for our blue cheese, which is um, pretty special and, like I said, award-winning. And it's here. Yes. This and what they can try it today. Like. Um, but we also make a wonderful cheese you should all try called Toma. And Toma is actually a variety of cheese. It's not that common here in the U.S., but in Italy it's called Toma. In France it's called Tome. And it's slang for a farmer's wheel. So it's basically a cheese version of a table wine. So it's the cheese you're going to keep at your lunch table and, you know, hack off a piece to have with your uh, bread and your um, your cured meats at lunchtime. And um, Tom is very, very friendly. It uh, melts super well. It makes a great mac and cheese, makes a great panini, quesadilla. So we make toma, we make a fresh mozzarella in the summertime, which we only make seasonally. We make it from about Mother's Day through October because we like to uh, pair it with heirloom tomatoes. So we make that, yeah. And then we do our cheesemaker's always doing R&D projects and um, fun things. Right now he's working on a Gouda. Ooh. Yeah. Yeah, delicious. I bet yours will be just, I know it will be great because all of your cheeses are great. I have to try the Toma. I haven't tried it. Yeah. It's, yeah. Sounds enticing. Yes. Yes. Um, okay, wonderful. So this was this was a really great lesson on on how to look for cheese and what to kind of look for in terms of um, you know what, you know how to smell, how to t take a look at the rind, how to use the rind. So um, that's really helpful. And of course, you can use any cheese that you have and experiment. And hopefully, we want you to use Point Reyes because it's the best. But anything <laughs> works. And, and don't be afraid to experiment in the kitchen, right? Which yes. Is, it's a lot don't of fun. be afraid. And don't be afraid. Um, if you do buy a semi-firm cheese and it gets a little piece of mold on it, go ahead and cut it off and you can eat the rest of it. So don't be nervous about that. Um, cheese mold is pretty benign. Yeah. And um, you know you can probably hold on to it for a little bit longer than you thought you could. Yeah, good to know. So I, I want to ask about the business, and I know you know it's a family farm. It's been yeah. run by the same family for the entire uh, time that it's been in existence. So why is it important uh, to pass it from one generation to the next? And, you know, why, why is that an important value for the family? Yeah, so 
We are a farmstead, which I explained to you. It's a family-owned farm, and it's a women-owned dairy and creamery, wow. which is pretty unusual yeah. in our industry. Um, so there's a lot of history that goes back there that's really important to us to maintain that. And as a matter of fact, the whole executive team is all women. Um, so we have a really um, interesting outlook to um, to business and the uh, farming history in California. And the nice thing about having the continuity about keeping the um, farm going in the same family is we know the history of the land. So we know exactly what has gone in the dirt. We know exactly what the cows have been fed. We know, um, you know, we have a past, a present, and a future that's continuous, and that's just really important to us. Yeah, absolutely. And you do a, a lot of outreach, you do a lot of marketing, um, and you actually even hold events. So can you tell us a little bit we about do. that? We do, yeah. So we, our farm is open to the public because we really, really like to show the art of cheese making, hands-on to everybody. And um, from May to October, we hold Friday farm tours, and all you have to do is go on our website, PortMaysCheese.com and you can sign up for a farm tour. You can't come unless you've signed up just because we are a food manufacturing facility so we have to have um, laws that um, regulate visitors around that. But all you have to do is sign up, show up, and um, it's great for little kids. They can pet the cows, um, see what the cows are fed, the cows get milked, and then the cheese gets made and you get to see that whole process. So fun. And I asked her, can we come and actually milk the cows ourselves? <laughs> and she said, no, it's all done by machine. But yes. wouldn't that be fun? It right? would be fun. It would be fun. <laughs> have you ever tried? I have milked cows, and it's actually really physical hard work. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Right? Yeah. Don't you have to get down on yes, it like you have a to get down. stool? And yeah. Yeah, it's hard. Get in there. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it actually is really hard. Amazing. Okay, so for more information on a, you know, a, a farm tour, check out pointraisecheese.com. Really great to know. Yeah. And it'd be fun to visit that area if you've never been. It's beautiful. It's breathtaking. Yes. Yeah. All right, I think it's demo time. You guys ready to learn how to make an amazing recipe with this Point Reyes blue cheese? Yes. All right, let's get to it. So we have some delicious mashed potatoes here. And what you need is actually, these are pre-made, obviously. But you really want to start with just a incredibly ready, ripe, delicious russet potatoes, okay? Clean them up. I like to keep the skin on. If you're doing skin off, you can take them off. And put them in a pot of cold water, let them come up to a boil, and then boil them, okay? It takes anywhere between 10 to 20 minutes, depending on how big your pot is and how much you're making. Um, you want to just boil them until you can insert a knife right into the center, and then once it's like ready, just tender, then they're ready to be strained. So strain those out. I put it into a really large bowl or a pot, which is great, and just give it a mash. So we have done that already, and this is basically what it looks like. These are nice and warm, and you can also use a variety of different potatoes. It looks like this was done with a red potato. Red skin potato works just fine. Um, these are tend to be a little bit more waxy as opposed to the russet potatoes, uh, which just tend to have a more, cream, a more creamy texture and starchy texture. So this looks really great. Now we have to add the star of the show because we are making blue cheese creamy mashed potatoes. So I need some blue. Yeah, there you go. I'm gonna need a little bit more. So we have Easter coming up, we have Mother's Day coming up, yes. and this would just be so delicious with lamb, salmon, chicken, just a great side. Absolutely, yeah. Okay, so just give that a nice stir to kind of combine everything and make sure that it kind of melts away. And I kind of give it a second over a, you know, a low simmer just to kind of let it melt and do its thing. That is delicious. All right, I'm gonna wipe up my hands here. Doesn't that smell good, you guys? Yum! So how easy is that? Anyone can do it. I hope that you guys will try a recipe like this at home. It's just to die for. It's super creamy. It has that bite that you get from the, the blue cheese, which is just perfect, and it pairs well with the potato. So that is our delicious, creamy blue cheese mashed potato. Um, all right, so thank you so much for being here. Thank Let's you. give thank Felice you. a huge round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I'm going to just wrap you guys up here. Um, you know, we are excited to have you here. It's our opening day. And next up on this stage at 245 is going to be Family Time Demo, where you're going to learn tips and tricks on how to make food geared really towards kids to allow them to do it on their own. So come back for that. And don't forget to go to Disneyland.com slash food and 
online to purchase tickets for all of our signature events. And that's a wrap, everyone. Go out there, have a great day. Our festival continues through April 12th, so we hope you'll be back for more fun, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye, everyone.